Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the October 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of A Caricature of Marxism and Imperialist Economism by Lenin from 1916. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon, or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialismforall, or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So this piece was written between August and October 1916. It was first published in the magazines Vesda numbers 1 and 2, 1924, signed V. Lenin, and published according to that manuscript, verified with the typewritten copy, containing Lenin's corrections. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1964, Moscow, Volume 23, translated by M.S. Levin, the late Joe Feinberg, and others, HTML transcription and markup by R. Symbala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. I want to mention before we begin that you might not know this piece by name. It's not one of Lenin's better known titles. However, those who know, know there's a ton of good theory and just good quotations in this. Lots to get into, and remember, Late 1916, this is about one year before the Russian Revolution and about six months before the February Revolution, which overthrew the Tsar. Also in the midst of World War I and the betrayal of the Second Socialist International, which paved the way for the split between what we today refer to as social democrats or reformists. That's not to say that Marxists never pursue reforms. Read Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution. But when you limit yourself to mere reforms, that is reformism, per se. So the split between them and what we would today call communists, Marxists, Marxist-Leninists, etc. Prior to that split, everybody was known as social democracy, pretty much. That was more or less a synonym for Marxism. So Lenin begins with a quote, No one can discredit revolutionary social democracy as long as it does not discredit itself. Unquote. That maxim always comes to mind and must always be borne in mind when any major theoretical or tactical proposition of Marxism is victorious or even placed on the order of the day, and when, besides outright and resolute opponents, it's assailed by friends who hopelessly discredit and disparage it and turn it into a caricature. That has happened time and again in the history of the Russian social democratic movement. In the early 90s, that's the 1890s, the victory of Marxism in the revolutionary movement was attended by the emergence of a caricature of Marxism in the shape of economism, or strikeism. The Iskrists, that is, supporters of Iskra, the spark, Lenin's newspaper, would not have been able to uphold the fundamentals of proletarian theory and policy, either against petty bourgeois narratism, populism, or bourgeois liberalism, without long years of struggle against economism. It was the same with Bolshevism, which triumphed in the mass labor movement in 1905, due, among other things, to correct application to the boycott of the Tsarist Duma slogan in the autumn of 1905, when the key battles of the Russian Revolution were being fought. Bolshevism had to face, and overcome by struggle, another caricature in 1908-10, when Aleksinsky and others noisily opposed participation in the Third Duma. So a couple of footnotes here. First of all, the Duma was the Russian parliament. Originally, there was not a parliament, but after the 1905 revolution, there was one set up, but it was not binding. So going into MIA's footnote, the Bulligan Duma derived its name from the Minister of the Interior, A.G. Bulligan, who drafted the act for its convocation and the regulations governing the elections. The Duma was intended to be an advisory body under the Tsar. The Bolsheviks called for an active boycott of the Duma and concentrated their propaganda on the following slogans, armed uprising, revolutionary army, provisional revolutionary government. They used the boycott campaign to mobilize all the revolutionary forces, carry out mass political strikes, and prepare an armed uprising. The nationwide general political strike of October 1905 and the mounting wave of revolution prevented the elections and the Duma was never convened. Lenin discusses the Bulligan Duma in his articles, The Constitutional Marketplace, The Boycott of the Bulligan Duma and Insurrection, oneness of the Tsar and the people, and of the people and the Tsar, in the wake of the monarchist bourgeoisie, or in the vanguard of the revolutionary proletariat and peasantry. Second footnote in regard to Aleksinsky and others opposing participation in the Third Duma, 
This is a reference to the Otsivists and Ultimatumists. The Otsivists were an opportunist group composed of A.A. A. Bogdanov, G.A. Aleksinsky, A.V. Sokolov, also known as S. Volsky, A.V. Lunacharsky, M.N. Lyadov, and others, which emerged among a section of the Bolsheviks in 1908. Under cover of revolutionary phrases, they demanded the recall, the Russian word Otsovat means recall, of the Social Democratic members of the Third Duma. They also refused to work in legal organizations, the trade unions, cooperatives, and other mass organizations, contending that in conditions of rampant reaction, the party must confine itself exclusively to illegal activity. The Otsovists did immense damage to the party. Their policy would have isolated the party from the masses and in the end would have turned it into a sectarian organization. Ultimatumism was a variety of Otsovism from which it differed only in form. The ultimatumists proposed that the Social Democratic Duma members, so the Marxist parliamentary members at that time, be presented with an ultimatum. Either they fully submit to the decisions of the party central committee or be recalled from the Duma. The ultimatumists failed to appreciate the need for painstaking work to help the Social Democratic deputies overcome their mistakes and adopt a consistent revolutionary line. Ultimatumism was, in fact, disguised Otsivism. Lenin called the ultimatumists bashful Otsivists. So basically, Lenin is saying there was a time to boycott the Duma, that was a correct move then, and then there was a time to participate in it, based on the conditions and circumstances. However, there was a struggle among the Bolsheviks each time, just as there was an earlier struggle against economism, which you can go back to what is to be done for a breakdown of some of the issues Lenin had with the economists. This isn't people who were into economics. It was a group of people who basically believed that the best that the masses could do was trade union consciousness. In other words, they could figure out that organizing could lead to better conditions on the job and things like that, but that revolutionary theory should be left to the liberal intelligentsia, basically, and that proletarian revolutionary theory was not really something that needed to be developed, or basically the masses should just be trusted to do spontaneous activity, and then the party should just sort of observe that. Lenin, of course, did not agree with this. So even when Marxism succeeds and advances, there are these caricatures that pop up. You're going to, of course, have the enemies of Marxism. That's always to be expected. But even among people who support it or claim to support it, but then actually are acting out these discrediting caricatures. So those need to be struggled against. And that's the topic of this essay. Continuing, it's the same today, too. Recognition of the present war, World War I, as imperialist, an emphasis on its close connection with the imperialist era of capitalism, encounters not only resolute opponents, but also irresolute friends, for whom the word imperialism has become all the rage. Having memorized the word, they're offering the workers hopelessly confused theories and reviving many of the old mistakes of the old economism. Capitalism has triumphed. Therefore, there's no need to bother with political problems, the old economists reasoned in 1894 to 1901, falling into rejection of the political struggle in Russia. Imperialism has triumphed. Therefore, there's no need to bother with the problems of political democracy, reason these present-day imperialist economists. Kievsky's article, printed above, merits attention as a sample of these sentiments as one such caricature of Marxism, as the first attempt to provide anything like an integral literary exposition of the vacillation that has been apparent in certain circles of our party abroad since early 1915. If imperialist economism were to spread among the Marxists, who, in the present great crisis of socialism, again that split of the Second International, have resolutely come out against social chauvinism and for revolutionary internationalism, that would be a very grave blow to our trend and to our party, for it would discredit it from within, from its own ranks, would make it a vehicle of caricaturized Marxism. It is therefore necessary to thoroughly discuss at least the most important of Kievsky's numerous errors, regardless of how, quote, uninteresting this may be, and regardless of the fact also that all too often we shall have to tediously explain elementary truths which the thoughtful and attentive reader has learned and understood long since from our literature of 1914 and 15. We shall begin with the central point of Kievsky's disquisitions in order to immediately bring to the reader the very, quote, substance of this new trend of imperialist economism. Section 1. The Marxist Attitude Toward War and, quote, Defense of the Fatherland. Kievsky is convinced and wants to convince his reader that he disagrees 
only with Section 9 of our party program that deals with national self-determination. He's very angry and tries to refute the charge that on the question of democracy, he is departing from the fundamentals of Marxism in general, that he has, quote, betrayed, the angry quotation marks or Kievsky's, Marxism on basic issues. But the point is that the moment our author begins to discuss his allegedly partial disagreement on an individual issue, the moment he adduces his arguments, considerations, etc., he immediately reveals that he is deviating from Marxism all along the line. Take section B or section 2 of his article, quote, This demand, that is, national self-determination, directly leads to social patriotism, unquote, our author proclaims, explaining that the, quote, treasonous slogan of fatherland defense follows, quote, quite logically from the right of nations to self-determination, unquote. In his opinion, self-determination implies, quote, sanctioning the treason of the French and Belgian social patriots who are defending this independence, the national independence of France and Belgium, with arms in hand. They are doing what the supporters of self-determination only advocate, unquote. Quote, defense of the fatherland belongs to the arsenal of our worst enemies. Quote, we categorically refuse to understand how one can simultaneously be against defense of the fatherland and for self-determination, against the fatherland and for it, unquote. That's Kievsky. He obviously has not understood our resolutions against the fatherland defense slogan in the present war. It's therefore necessary again to explain the meaning of what is so clearly set out in our resolutions. Comment. So Lenin's about to explain it, but basically this whole split in the Second International was over the question of World War I. Were the socialist parties of Europe going to lead the working classes of Europe into war on behalf of the capitalists? That's the defense of the fatherland. Or were the socialists of Europe going to lead the working classes of Europe into rising up against the war, against the capitalists who are telling them to go kill each other for the sake of the fatherland. Revolutionary defeatism. Defeat all around for the bourgeois governments, turning the imperialist war into a war against the imperialists for social revolution. Continuing, the resolution our party adopted at its Bern conference in March 1915, titled On the Defense of the Fatherland Slogan, begins with the words, quote, The present war is in substance. That the resolution deals with the present war could not have been put more plainly. The words in substance indicate that we must distinguish between the apparent and the real, between appearance and substance, between the word and the deed. The purpose of all talk about defense of the fatherland in this war is mendaciously or dishonestly to present as national the imperialist war of 1914-16, to waged for the division of colonies, the plunder of foreign lands, etc., and to obviate even the slightest possibility of distorting our views, we added to the resolution a special paragraph on, quote, genuinely national wars, which, quote, took place especially, and especially does not mean exclusively, between 1789 and 1871. The resolution explains that the, quote, basis of these, quote, genuinely national wars was a, quote, long process of mass national movements, the struggle against absolutism and feudalism, the overthrow of national oppression, unquote. Comment, it's understood in Marxism, in historical materialism, that the progression from feudalism into capitalism, these are basically tasks of the bourgeoisie, but what they need to do in overthrowing feudalism and establishing capitalism is to set up a nation state, which serves as a market for goods produced under capitalism, although eventually, as you get into the imperialist era, that home market gets saturated and then other lands have to be conquered, capital investments have to be sent abroad, in other words, to keep profits up. At that point, the capitalists have fulfilled their historical duty and the proletariat can take it from there with, again, social revolution. So imperialist wars, wars fought by imperialist powers, that is, advanced monopoly capitalist powers, are not what the Marxists considered genuinely national wars. In their case, that ship sailed a long time ago. The nation state was already set up, etc. In fact, by that point, by the time it becomes imperialist, those national borders that at first helped it as a kind of crutch for getting set up and creating that home market are now constraining the capital, which needs to keep expanding or it dies. In fact, dying is exactly what we want it to do. That is, we want it to be expropriated by a worker's state in a social revolutionary process and then have a new system set up 
in place of the old capitalist system for managing the not-for-profit production of goods and services. Okay, so national wars versus imperial wars. Continuing. Clear, it would seem. The present imperialist war stems from the general conditions of the imperialist era and is not accidental, not an exception, not a deviation from the general and typical. Talk of defense of the fatherland is therefore a deception of the people, for this war is not a national war. In a genuinely national war, the words defense of the fatherland are not a deception, and we are not opposed to it. Such genuinely national wars took place, quote, especially in 1789 to 1871, the early ascending phase of capitalism, at least in the first countries where capitalism took hold. And our resolution, while not denying by a single word that they are possible now too, explains how we should distinguish a genuinely national from an imperialist war covered by deceptive national slogans. Specifically, in order to distinguish the two, we must examine whether the basis of the war is a, quote, long process of mass national movements and the overthrow of national oppression. So comment, somebody was asking, is supporting Palestine some kind of campism? Is it picking sides? Is it defense of the fatherland in an imperialist war? The answer is absolutely not. Palestine is not internationally completely recognized as a state. It's fighting off a colonial racist occupation. It is a nation struggling to form. It is fighting a nationalist war for the existence of its nation, for basics like land, secure territorial borders, and so on. So that genuinely national war is not over. So in that stage of historical development, yes, you're going to see capitalists participating. So this is the role of a popular front in a national liberation struggle. Marxists, Marxist-Leninists will participate in that also because the more guidance and leadership that can be had during the struggle, then the easier the transition after the nation is established and the national oppression is fought off, etc., that then it's a hop, skip, and a jump to social revolution from there. So that wasn't the case when England and France and Germany were getting established as capitalist powers overthrowing feudalism. The proletariat at that time was fairly weak, not well developed. Marx and Engels only came along in the 1840s. So Marxism as we knew it, you know, really wasn't a thing for some of that development. But then as time went on, the proletariat began developing more proletarian ideology. Well, as for the later national liberation struggles, you could have more Marxist proletarian participation. All right, continuing. Could our 1915 party resolution speak of the national wars waged from 1789 to 1871 and say that we do not deny the positive significance of such wars if they were not considered possible today too? Certainly not. A commentary or popular explanation of our party resolutions is given in the Lenin and Zinoviev pamphlet, Socialism and War. It plainly states on page 5 that, quote, socialists have regarded wars for the defense of the fatherland, or defense of wars as legitimate, progressive, and just, unquote, only in the sense of, quote, overthrowing alien oppression, unquote. It cites an example, Persia against Russia, quote, etc., and says, quote, these would be just and defensive wars, irrespective of who would be the first to attack. Any socialist would wish the oppressed, dependent, and unequal states victory over the oppressor, slaveholding, and predatory, quote, great powers, unquote. The pamphlet appeared in August 1915, and there are German and French translations. Kievsky is fully aware of its contents, and never, on no occasion, has he or anyone else challenged the resolution on the defense of the fatherland slogan or the resolution on pacifism or their interpretation in the pamphlet. Never, not once. We are therefore entitled to ask, are we slandering Kievsky when we say that he has absolutely failed to understand Marxism if, beginning with March 1915, he has not challenged our party's views on the war, whereas now in August 1916, in an article on self-determination, i.e. on a supposedly partial issue, he reveals an amazing lack of understanding of a general issue. Kievsky says that the Fatherland Defense slogan is, quote, treasonous. We can confidently assure him that every slogan is and always will be treasonous for those who mechanically repeat it without understanding its meaning, without giving it proper thought, for those who merely memorize the words without analyzing their implications. What, generally speaking, is defense of the fatherland. 
Is it a scientific concept relating to economics, politics, etc.? No, it's a much bandied about current expression, sometimes simply a philistine phrase intended to justify the war. Nothing more. Absolutely nothing. The term treasonous can apply only in the sense that the Philistine is capable of justifying any war by pleading, we are defending our fatherland. Whereas Marxism, which does not degrade itself by stooping to the Philistine's level, requires an historical analysis of each war in order to determine whether or not that particular war can be considered progressive, whether it serves the interests of democracy and the proletariat, and, in that sense, is legitimate, just, etc., the defense of the fatherland slogan is all too often unconscious Philistine justification of war, and it reveals inability to analyze the meaning and implications of a particular war and see it in historical perspective. Marxism makes that analysis and says, if the substance of a war is, for example, the overthrow of alien oppression, which was especially typical of Europe in 1789 to 1871, then such a war is progressive as far as the oppressed state or nation is concerned. If, however, the substance of a war is redivision of colonies, division of booty, plunder of foreign lands, and such is the war of 1914-16, to then all talk of defending the fatherland is sheer deception of the people. How, then, can we disclose and define this substance of a war? War is the continuation of policy. Consequently, we must examine the policy pursued prior to the war, the policy that led to and brought about the war. If it was an imperialist policy, i.e. one designed to safeguard the interests of finance capital, finance capital is the merger of financial or bank capital and industrial capital when they both get so big that they basically just intermingle, and rob and oppress colonies and foreign countries, then the war stemming from that policy is imperialist. If it was a national liberation policy, i.e. one expressive of the mass movement against national oppression, then the war stemming from that policy is a war of national liberation. The Philistine does not realize that war is the continuation of policy, and consequently limits himself to the formula that the enemy has attacked us, the enemy has invaded my country, without stopping to think what issues are at stake in the war, which classes are waging it, and with what political objects or goals. Kievsky stoops right down to the level of such a Philistine when he declares that Belgium has been occupied by the Germans, and hence, from the point of view of self-determination, the, quote, Belgian social patriots are right, or the Germans have occupied part of France, hence, Gesda can be satisfied, a French sort of socialist, for what is involved is territory populated by his nation, and not an alien nation. For the Philistine, the important thing is where the armies stand, who is winning at the moment, for the Marxist, the important thing is what issues are at stake in this war, during which first one, then the other army may be on top. What is the present war being fought over? The answer is given in our resolution, based on the policy the belligerent powers pursued for decades prior to the war. England, France, and Russia are fighting to keep the colonies they've seized, to be able to rob Turkey, etc. Germany is fighting to take over these colonies and to be able herself to rob Turkey, etc., let us suppose even that the Germans take Paris or St. Petersburg. Would that change the nature of the present war? Not at all. The Germans' purpose, and more important, the policy that would bring it to realization if they were to win, is to seize the colonies, establish domination over Turkey, annex areas populated by other nations, for instance Poland, etc. It's definitely not to bring the French or the Russians under foreign domination. The real essence of the present war is not national but imperialist, in other words, it's not being fought to enable one side to overthrow national oppression, which the other side is trying to maintain. It is a war between two groups of oppressors, between two freebooters over the division of their booty, over who shall rob Turkey and the colonies. In short, a war between imperialist great powers, i.e. powers that oppress a whole number of nations and enmesh them in dependence on finance capital, etc., or in alliance with the great powers, is an imperialist war such as the War of 1914-16, to and in this war, defense of the fatherland is a deception, an attempt to justify the war. A war against imperialist, i.e. oppressing powers by oppressed, for example, colonial nations, is a genuine national war. It's possible today, too. Defense of the fatherland in a war waged by an oppressed nation against a foreign oppressor is not a deception. Socialists are not opposed to defense of the fatherland as a slogan in such a war. National self-determination is the same as the struggle for complete national liberation, 
for complete independence against annexation. And socialists cannot, without ceasing to be socialists, reject such a struggle in whatever form, right down to an uprising or war. Kievsky thinks he's arguing against Plekhanov. It was Plekhanov who pointed to the link between self-determination and defense of the fatherland. Kievsky believed Plekhanov that the link was really of the kind Plekhanov made it out to be. And having believed him, Kievsky took fright and decided that he must reject self-determination so as not to fall into Plekhanov's conclusions. There is great trust in Plekhanov and great fright, but there is no trace of thought about the substance of Plekhanov's mistake. The social chauvinists plead self-determination in order to present this war as a national war. There's only one correct way of combating them. We must show that the war is being fought not to liberate nations, but to determine which of the great robbers will oppress more nations. To fall into negation of wars really waged for liberating nations is to present the worst possible caricature of Marxism. Plekhanov and the French social chauvinists harp on the Republic in France in order to justify its defense against the German monarchy. If we were to follow Kievsky's line of reasoning, we would have to oppose either the Republic or a war really fought to preserve the Republic. The German social chauvinists point to universal suffrage and compulsory primary education in their country to justify its defense against Tsarism. If we were to follow Kievsky's line of reasoning, we would have to oppose either universal suffrage and compulsory primary education or a war really fought to safeguard political freedom against attempts to abolish it. Up to the 1914-16 war, Karl Kautsky was a Marxist, and many of his major writings and statements will always remain models of Marxism. On August 26, 1910, he wrote in Die Neue Zeit in reference to the imminent war, quote, In a war between Germany and England, the issue is not democracy, but world domination, i.e. exploitation of the world. That is not an issue on which social democrats can side with the exploiters of their nation, unquote. There you have an excellent Marxist formulation, one that fully coincides with our own and fully exposes the present-day Kautsky, who has turned from Marxism to defense of social chauvinism. It's a formulation, we shall have occasion to revert to it in other articles, that clearly brings out the principles underlying the Marxist attitude about war. War is the continuation of policy. Hence, once there is a struggle for democracy, a war for democracy is possible. National self-determination is but one of the democratic demands and does not, in principle, differ from other democratic demands. World domination is, to put it briefly, the substance of imperialist policy, of which imperialist war is the continuation. Rejection of defense of the fatherland in a democratic war, i.e., rejecting participation in such a war, is an absurdity that has nothing in common with Marxism. To embellish imperialist war by applying to it the concept of defense of the fatherland, i.e., by presenting it as a democratic war, is to deceive the workers and side with the reactionary bourgeoisie. Section 2. The title is a quote, Our Understanding of the New Era, unquote. The heading is Kievsky's. He constantly speaks of a, quote, new era, but here too, unfortunately, his arguments are erroneous. Our party resolutions speak of the present war as stemming from the general conditions of the imperialist era. We give a correct Marxist definition of the relation between the era and the present war. Marxism requires a concrete assessment of each separate war to understand why an imperialist war, i.e., a war thoroughly reactionary and anti-democratic in its political implications, could and inevitably did break out between the great powers, many of whom stood at the head of the struggle for democracy back in 1789 to 1871. To understand this, we must understand the general conditions of the imperialist era, i.e., the transformation of capitalism in the advanced countries into imperialism. Comment. So again, Lenin's making the point, capitalism is not the same from its inception to his time when he was writing in 1916. It had changed, so it has an earlier ascending phase where it's struggling to establish itself, the bourgeoisie are struggling against the feudal ruling order in order to create the conditions necessary for the further development of capitalism. That would be bourgeois democracy, democracy at least for that capitalist class, which needs to settle certain things amongst their class. If their system is going to last at all, they're going to need to have some kind of clearinghouse, a state that can function as, you know, settling disputes between capitalists and so on. This means, from the point of view of somebody living on this cusp of dying feudalism and about to be born capitalism, the initiation of a totally new system, 
It will, of course, have some things in common, like the ruling class is still a minority of the population and not the majority. But there will have to be more general education, more rights, different things, different set of conditions for this new society based on capitalism to flourish. So they fight for national liberation and for establishing this new system, and they are freedom fighters, although they really oversell that because a lot of the people they get to fight for them are actually going to be exploited by this system. However, overall, in Marxism, we consider that capitalism was a step forward overall from feudalism. But it's definitely not the end of the story of historical development and class struggle. Capitalism basically turns almost all the population over time, the longer it runs, into the proletariat, a class which has existed since the early days of class society, but never in such numbers. Proletarians are propertyless people who generally must sell their labor as wage workers to live. So as time goes on and capitalism is run in a country, just like a chemical process, a reaction that occurs over time, what happens is the composition of the society changes. There emerges a very small ruling bourgeoisie, which owns everything and runs the government and makes the rules. And then the rest of the population that used to be various other artisan classes and different things basically becomes proletarians, wage workers. That's how it ends up. There's always also a slim slice of petty bourgeoisie, which serves a function as far as keeping capitalism running. But basically, you've got the 1%, maybe the 10% of the petty bourgeoisie, and then everybody else, the proletariat. Proletariat, though, has no interest in maintaining a system based on private property, and as capitalism progresses, it has weak moments, crises, and eventually it trends towards greater and greater instability and a final crisis from which it really cannot recover. At any point, the proletariat can get organized enough, and if its strength and organization ever exceeds that of the bourgeoisie, and it has the resolve to pull it off, revolution is possible. But yeah, the basic point that there is this ascending phase of capitalism where it's fighting for democracy and rights and things that didn't exist under feudalism. After it gets consolidated and the nation state has served its purpose as a kind of brace or training wheels for capitalism, it starts to outgrow that and seek domination of places beyond its borders. This is the transition into imperialism. Lenin wrote a whole book about it. We're going to do it on the channel soon. It's called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, in which he describes the nature of the system, how to identify it, etc. Verdi talked in this text about a few things, the emergence of finance capital and monopolies and trusts, so on. But the point is, these are the same countries, but in a different later phase of capitalism. Capital tends to consolidate over time, and the behavior of highly consolidated capital is different because its material needs are different. Continuing, Kievsky has flagrantly distorted the relation between the era and the present war. In his reasoning, to consider the matter concretely means to examine the era. That is precisely where he is wrong. The era 1789 to 1871 was of special significance for Europe. That's irrefutable. We cannot understand a single national liberation war, and such wars were especially typical of that period, unless we understand the general conditions of the period. Does that mean that all wars of that period were national liberation wars? Certainly not. To hold that view is to reduce the whole thing to an absurdity and apply a ridiculous stereotype in place of a concrete analysis of each separate war. There were also colonial wars in 1789 to 1871 and wars between reactionary empires that oppressed many nations. Advanced European and American capitalism has entered a new era of imperialism. Does it follow from that that only imperialist wars are now possible? Any such contention would be absurd. It would reveal an ability to distinguish a given concrete phenomenon from the sum total of variegated phenomena possible in a given era. An era is called an era precisely because it encompasses the sum total of variegated phenomena and wars, typical and untypical, big and small, some peculiar to advanced countries, others to backward countries. To brush aside these concrete questions by resorting to general phrases about the era, as Kievsky does, is to abuse the very concept, era. And to prove that, we shall cite one example out of many. But first, it should be noted that one group of lefts, namely the German Internationale Group, has advanced this manifestly erroneous proposition in section 5 of its theses, published in number 3 of the Bulletin of the Bern Executive Committee, 
February 29, 1916, quote, National wars are no longer possible in the era of this unbridled imperialism, unquote. We analyzed that statement in Spornik Social Democrata. Here, we need merely note that though everyone who has followed the internationalist movement is long acquainted with this theoretical proposition, we opposed it way back in the spring of 1916 at the extended meeting of the Bern Executive Committee. Not a single group has repeated or accepted it, and there's not a single word in the spirit of this or any similar proposition in Kievsky's article written in August 1916. That should be noted and for the following reason. If this or a similar theoretical proposition were advanced, then we could speak of theoretical divergencies. But since no such proposition has been advanced, we're constrained to say what we have is not a different interpretation of the concept era, not a theoretical divergency, but merely a carelessly uttered phrase, merely abuse of the word era. Here's an example. Kievsky starts his article by asking, quote, Is not this, self-determination, the same as the right to receive free of charge 10,000 acres of land on Mars? What? The question can be answered only in the most concrete manner, only in context with the nature of the present era. The right of nations to self-determination is one thing in the era of the formation of national states, as the best form of developing the productive forces at their then existing level. But it's quite another thing now that this form, the national state, fetters the development of the productive forces. A vast distance separates the era of the establishment of capitalism and the national state from the era of the collapse of the national state and the eve of the collapse of capitalism itself. To discuss things in general, out of context with time and space, does not be fit on Marxist, unquote. There you have a sample of caricaturing the concept imperialist era, and its caricature must be fought precisely because it is a new and important concept. What do we mean when we say that national states have become fetters, etc.? We have in mind the advanced capitalist countries, above all Germany, France, England, whose participation in the present war has been the chief factor in making it an imperialist war. In these countries, which hitherto have been in the van of mankind, particularly in 1789, to 1871, the process of forming national states has been consummated. In these countries, the national movement is a thing of an irrevocable past, and it would be an absurd reactionary utopia to try to revive it. The national movement of the French, English, Germans has long been completed in these countries. History's next step is a different one. Liberated nations have become transformed into oppressor nations, into nations of imperialist rapine, nations that are going through the eve of the collapse of capitalism. But what of other nations? Kievsky repeats, like a rule learned by rote, that Marxists should approach things, quote, concretely, but he does not apply that rule. In our theses, on the other hand, we deliberately gave an example of a concrete approach, and Kievsky did not wish to point out our mistake if he found one. Our theses, section 6, state that to be concrete, not less than three different types of countries must be distinguished, when dealing with self-determination. It was clearly impossible to discuss each separate country in general theses. First type, the advanced countries of Western Europe and America, where the national movement is a thing of the past. Second type, Eastern Europe, where it's a thing of the present. Third type, semi-colonies and colonies, where it is largely a thing of the future. Is this correct or not? This is what Kievsky should have leveled his criticism at, but he does not see the essence of the theoretical problems. He fails to see that unless he refutes the above-mentioned proposition in section 6 of our theses, and it cannot be refuted because it's correct, his disquisitions about the era resemble a man brandishing his sword but striking no blows. Quote, in contrast to V. Ilian's opinion, he writes at the end of his article, quote, we assume that for the majority of Western countries the national problem has not been settled, unquote. And so, the national movements of the French, Spaniards, English, Dutch, Germans, and Italians were not consummated in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and earlier? At the beginning of the article, the concept era of imperialism is distorted to make it appear that the national movement has been consummated in general, and not only in the advanced Western countries. At the end of the same article, the, quote, national problem is declared, quote, not settled in precisely the Western countries. Is that not a muddle? In the Western countries, the national movement is a thing of the distant past. In England, France, Germany, etc., the fatherland is a dead letter, 
It has played its historical role, i.e., the national movement cannot yield here anything progressive, anything that will elevate new masses to a new economic and political life. History's next step here is not transition from feudalism or from patriarchal savagery to national progress, to a cultured and politically free fatherland, but transition from a fatherland that has outlived its day, that is capitalistically overripe, to socialism. The position is different in Eastern Europe. As far as the Ukrainians and Belarusians, for instance, are concerned, only a Martian dreamer could deny that the national movement has not yet been consummated there, that the awakening of the masses to the full use of their mother tongue and literature, and this is an absolute condition and concomitant of the full development of capitalism, of the full penetration of exchange to the very last peasant family, is still going on there. The fatherland is historically not yet quite a dead letter there. There, the defense of the fatherland can still be defense of democracy, of one's native language, of political liberty against oppressor nations, against medievalism, whereas the French, English, Germans, and Italians lie when they speak of defending their fatherland in the present war, because actually what they're defending is not their native language, not their right to national development, but their rights as slaveholders, their colonies, the foreign spheres of influence of their finance capital, etc., in the semi-colonies and colonies, the national movement is, historically, still younger than in Eastern Europe. What do the words advanced countries and imperialist era refer to? In what lies the special position of Russia, a term taken from the heading of section E of the second chapter of Kievsky's article, and not only Russia, where is the national liberation movement a false phrase, and where is it a living and progressive reality? Kievsky reveals no understanding on any of these points. Section 3. What is Economic Analysis? Central to all the disquisitions of the self-determination opponents is the claim that it is generally, quote, unachievable under capitalism or imperialism. The word unachievable is frequently used in widely different and inaccurately defined meanings. That is why in our theses we insisted on what is essential in any theoretical discussion, an explanation of what is meant by unachievable. Nor did we confine ourselves to that. We tried to give such an explanation. All democratic demands are unachievable under imperialism in the sense that politically they are hard to achieve or totally unachievable without a series of revolutions. It's fundamentally wrong, however, to maintain that self-determination is unachievable in the economic sense. That has been our contention. It is the pivotal point of our theoretical differences, a question to which our opponents in any serious discussion should have paid due attention. But just see how Kievsky treats the question. He definitely rejects unachievable as meaning hard to achieve politically. He gives a direct answer in the sense of economic unachievability. Quote, Does this mean, Kievsky writes, that self-determination under imperialism is just as unachievable as labor money under commodity production? And he replies, quote, yes, it means exactly that. For what we are discussing is the logical contradiction between two social categories, imperialism and self-determination of nations. The same logical contradiction is that between two other categories, labor money and commodity production. Imperialism is the negation of self-determination, and no magician can reconcile the two, unquote. Frightening as is the angry word magician Kievsky hurls at us, we must nevertheless point out that he simply fails to understand what economic analysis implies. There should be no logical contradiction, providing, of course, that there is proper logical thinking, either in an economic or political analysis. Hence, to plead a logical contradiction in general, when what we are discussing is economic and not political analysis, is completely irrelevant. Both economic and political phenomena come within social categories. Consequently, having first replied directly and definitely, quote, yes, it means exactly that, i.e. self-determination is just as unachievable as labor money under commodity production, Kievsky dismisses the whole matter by beating about the bush without offering any economic analysis. How do we prove that labor money is unachievable under commodity production? By economic analysis. And economic analysis, like every other, rules out logical contradictions, takes economic and only economic categories, and not social categories in general, and from them concludes that labor money is unachievable. In the first chapter of Capital, there is no mention whatever of politics or political forms or social categories. The analysis applies only to economic phenomena, commodity exchange, its development. 
Economic analysis shows, needless to say, through logical arguments, that under commodity production, labor money is unachievable. Kievsky does not even attempt anything approximating an economic analysis. He conjures the economic substance of imperialism with its political tendencies, as is obvious from the very first phrase, the very first paragraph of his article. Here is that phrase, quote, Industrial capital is the synthesis of pre-capitalist production and merchant usurer capital. Usurer capital becomes the servant of industrial capital. Then capitalism subjects the various forms of capital and there emerges its highest unified type, finance capital. The whole era can therefore be designated as the era of finance capital, of which imperialism is the corresponding foreign policy system." Unquote. Economically, that definition is absolutely worthless. Instead of precise economic categories, we get mere phrases. However, it's impossible to dwell on that now. The important thing is that Kievsky proclaims imperialism to be a foreign policy system. First, this is essentially a wrong repetition of Kautsky's wrong idea. Second, it is a purely political and only political definition of imperialism. By defining imperialism as a system of policy, Kievsky wants to avoid the economic analysis he promised to give when he declared that self-determination was, quote, just as unachievable, i.e. economically unachievable, under imperialism as labor money under commodity production. Footnote from Lenin here. Is Kievsky aware of the impolite word Marx used in reference to such, quote, logical methods? Without applying this impolite term to Kievsky, we nevertheless are obliged to remark that Marx describes such methods as fraudulent, arbitrarily inserting precisely what is at issue, precisely what has to be proved in defining a concept. We repeat, we do not apply Marx's impolite expression to Kievsky. We merely disclose the source of his mistake. Back to the text. In his controversy with the left, Kautsky declared that imperialism was, quote, merely a system of foreign policy, unquote, namely annexation, and that it would be wrong to describe as imperialism a definite economic stage or level in the development of capitalism. Kautsky is wrong. Of course, it's not proper to argue about words. You cannot prohibit the use of the word imperialism in this sense or any other. But if you want to conduct a discussion, you must define your terms precisely. Economically, imperialism, or the era of finance capital, it's not a matter of words, is the highest stage in the development of capitalism, one in which production has assumed such big, immense proportions that free competition gives way to monopoly. That is the economic essence of imperialism. Monopoly manifests itself in trusts, syndicates, etc., in the omnipotence of the giant banks, in the buying up of raw material sources, etc., in the concentration of banking capital, etc., everything hinges on economic monopoly. The political superstructure of this new economy, of monopoly capitalism, imperialism is monopoly capitalism, is the change from democracy to political reaction. Democracy corresponds to free competition. Political reaction corresponds to monopoly. Quote, finance capital strives for domination, not freedom, Rudolf Hilferding rightly remarks in his finance capital. It is fundamentally wrong unmarxist and unscientific to single out foreign policy from policy in general, let alone counterpose foreign policy to home policy. Both in foreign and home policy, imperialism strives towards violations of democracy, towards reaction. In this sense, imperialism is indisputably the negation of democracy in general, of all democracy, not just of one of its demands, like national self-determination. Being a negation of democracy in general, imperialism is also a negation of democracy in the national question, i.e. national self-determination. It seeks to violate democracy. The achievement of democracy is, in the same sense, and to the same degree, harder under imperialism, compared with pre-monopoly capitalism, as the achievement of a republic, a militia, popular election of officials, etc. There can be no talk of democracy being, quote, economically unachievable. Kievsky was probably led astray here by the fact, besides his general lack of understanding the requirements of economic analysis, that the Philistine regards annexation, i.e. acquisition of foreign territories against the will of their people, i.e. violation of self-determination, as equivalent to the spread or expansion of finance capital to a larger economic territory. But theoretical problems should not be approached from Philistine conceptions. Economically, imperialism is monopoly capitalism. 
to acquire a full monopoly, all competition must be eliminated, and not only on the home market of the given state, but also on foreign markets in the whole world. Is it economically possible, quote, in the era of finance capital, to eliminate competition even in a foreign state? Certainly it is. It's done through a rival's financial dependence, an acquisition of his sources of raw materials, and eventually of all his enterprises. The American trusts are the supreme expression of the economics of imperialism or monopoly capitalism. They do not confine themselves to economic means of eliminating rivals, but constantly resort to political, even criminal methods. It would be the greatest mistake, however, to believe that the trusts cannot establish their monopoly by purely economic methods. Reality provides ample proof that this is achievable. The trusts undermine their rivals' credit through the banks, the owners of the trusts become the owners of the banks, buying up shares, their supply of materials. The owners of the trusts become the owners of the railways, buying up shares. For a certain time, the trusts sell below cost, spending millions on this in order to ruin a competitor and then buy up his enterprises, his sources of raw materials, mines, land, etc. There, you have a purely economic analysis of the power of the trusts and their expansion. There, you have the purely economic path to expansion buying up mills and factories, sources of raw materials. Big finance capital of one country can always buy up competitors in another, politically independent country, and constantly does so. Economically, this is fully achievable. Economic, quote, annexation is fully achievable without political annexation, and is widely practiced. In the literature on imperialism, you will constantly come across indications that Argentina, for example, is in reality a trade colony of Britain or that Portugal is in reality a vassal of Britain, etc. And that is actually so. Economic dependence upon British banks, indebtedness to Britain, British acquisition of their railways, mines, land, etc., enable Britain to annex these countries economically without violating their political independence. National self-determination means political independence. Imperialism seeks to violate such independence because political annexation often makes economic annexation easier, cheaper, it's easier to bribe officials, secure concessions, put through advantageous legislation, etc. More convenient, less troublesome, just as imperialism seeks to replace democracy generally by oligarchy. But to speak of the economic, quote, unachievability of self-determination under imperialism is sheer nonsense. Kievsky gets around the theoretical difficulties by a very simple and superficial dodge, known in German as Bershakoza phraseology i.e. primitive, crude phrases heard, and quite naturally, at student binges. Here's an example, quote, Universal suffrage, he writes, the eight-hour day, and even the republic are logically compatible with imperialism, though imperialism far from smiles on them, and their achievement is therefore extremely difficult, unquote. We would have absolutely no objections to the Bershakoza statement that imperialism far from, quote, smiles on the republic. A frivolous word can sometimes lend color to a scientific polemic. If in this polemic on a serious issue we were given, in addition, an economic and political analysis of the concepts involved. With Kievsky, however, the Bershakoza phrase does duty for such an analysis or serves to conceal a lack of it. What can this mean, imperialism far from smiles on the republic, and why? The Republic is one possible form of the political superstructure of capitalist society, and moreover, under present-day conditions, the most democratic form. To say that imperialism does not smile on the Republic is to say that there is a contradiction between imperialism and democracy. It may very well be that Kievsky does not smile, or even far from smiles, on this conclusion. Nevertheless, it's irrefutable. To continue, what is the nature of this contradiction between imperialism and democracy? Is it a logical or illogical contradiction? Kievsky uses the word logical without stopping to think, therefore does not notice that in this particular case it serves to conceal, both from the reader's and author's eyes and mind, the very question he sets out to discuss. That question is the relation of economics to politics, the relation of economic conditions and the economic content of imperialism to a certain political form. To say that every contradiction revealed in human discussion is a logical contradiction is meaningless tautology. And with the aid of this tautology, Kievsky evades the substance of the question. Is it a, quote, logical contradiction between two economic phenomena or propositions, or two political phenomena or propositions, or economic and political phenomena or propositions? For that is the heart of the matter, once we're discussing economic unachievability or achievability under one or another political form. 
Had Kievsky not evaded the heart of the matter, he would have probably realized that the contradiction between imperialism and the Republic is a contradiction between the economics of latter-day capitalism, namely monopoly capitalism, and political democracy in general. For Kievsky will never prove that any major and fundamental democratic measure, popular election of officials or officers, complete freedom of association and assembly, etc., is less contradictory to imperialism, or if you like, more smiled upon, than the Republic. What we have then is the proposition we advanced in our theses. Imperialism contradicts, quote, logically contradicts, all political democracy in general. Kievsky does not smile on this proposition, for it demolishes all his illogical constructions. But what can we do about it? Are we to accept the method that is supposed to refute certain propositions, but instead secretly advances them by using such expressions as imperialism far from smiles on the republic? Further, why does imperialism far from smile on the republic? And how does imperialism combine its economics with the republic? Kievsky has given no thought to that. We would remind him of the following words of Engels in reference to the democratic republic. Can wealth dominate under this form of government? The question concerns the, quote, contradiction between economics and politics. Engels replies, quote, The Democratic Republic officially knows nothing anymore of property distinctions between citizens. In it, wealth exercises its power indirectly, but all the more surely. On the one hand, in the form of the direct corruption of officials, of which America provides the classical example. On the other hand, in the form of an alliance between government and stock exchange. It's a quote from Engels' The Origin of the Family, Private Property in the State. There, you have an excellent example of economic analysis on the question of the achievability of democracy under capitalism, and the achievability of self-determination under imperialism is part of that question. The Democratic Republic, quote, logically contradicts capitalism because, officially, it puts the rich and the poor on an equal footing. That's a contradiction between the economic system and the political superstructure. There is the same contradiction between imperialism and the Republic, deepened or aggravated by the fact that the changeover from free competition to monopoly makes the realization of political freedoms even more, quote, difficult. How, then, is capitalism reconciled with democracy? By indirect implementation of the omnipotence of capital. There are two economic means for that. One, direct bribery. Two, alliance of government and stock exchange. That's stated in our theses. Under a bourgeois system, finance capital, quote, can freely bribe and buy any government and any official, unquote. Once we have the dominance of commodity production, of the bourgeoisie, of the power of money, bribery, direct or through the stock exchange, is achievable under any form of government and under any kind of democracy. What, it can be asked, is altered in this respect when capitalism gives way to imperialism, i.e., when pre-monopoly capitalism is replaced by monopoly capitalism. Only that the power of the stock exchange increases, for finance capital is industrial capital at its highest monopoly level, which is merged with banking capital. The big banks merge with and absorb the stock exchange. The literature on imperialism speaks of the declining role of the stock exchange, but only in the sense that every giant bank is itself virtually a stock exchange. Further, if wealth in general is fully capable of achieving domination over any democratic republic by bribery and through the stock exchange, then how can Kievsky maintain, without lapsing into a very curious, logical contradiction, that the immense wealth of the trusts and the banks, which have thousands of millions at their command, cannot achieve the domination of finance capital over a foreign, i.e. politically independent, republic? Well, bribery of officials is unachievable in a foreign state, or the alliance of government and stock exchange only applies to one's own government. The reader will already have seen that it requires roughly 10 pages of print to untangle and popularly explain 10 lines of confusion. We cannot examine every one of Kievsky's arguments in the same detail, and there's not a single one that is not confused, nor is there really any need for this once the main arguments have been examined. The rest will be dealt with briefly. Section 4. The Example of Norway Norway achieved the supposedly unachievable right to self-determination in 1905, in the era of the most rampant imperialism. It's therefore not only absurd, but ludicrous from the theoretical standpoint to speak of unachievability. Kievsky wants to refute that by angrily calling us rationalists. What does that have to do with it? The rationalist confines himself to purely abstract disquisitions, while we have pointed to a very concrete fact. But perhaps Kievsky is using the foreign word rationalist in the same, 
how to put it more mildly, in the same unhappy manner he used the word extractive at the beginning of his article, when he presented his arguments, quote, in extractive form. Kiebsky reproaches us. For us, he says, the important thing is the appearance of phenomena rather than the real substance. Well, let's examine the real substance. His refutation begins with this example. Enactment of law against trusts does not prove that their prohibition is unachievable. True enough. But the example is an unhappy one, for it militates against Kievsky. Laws are political measures, politics. No political measure can prohibit economic phenomena. Whatever political form Poland adopts, whether she be part of Tsarist Russia or Germany or an autonomous region or a politically independent state, there is no prohibiting or repealing her dependence on the finance capital of the imperialist powers, or preventing that capital from buying up the shares of her industries. The independence Norway achieved in 1905 was only political. It could not affect its economic dependence, nor was this the intention. This is exactly the point made in our theses. We indicated that self-determination concerns only politics, and it would therefore be wrong even to raise the question of its economic unachievability. But here is Kievsky, quote, refuting this, by citing an example of political bans being powerless against the economy. What a refutation. To proceed, quote, one or even many instances of small-scale industry prevailing over large-scale industry is not sufficient to refute Marx's correct proposition that the general development of capitalism is attended by the concentration and centralization of production, unquote. Again, the argument is based on an unfortunate example, chosen to divert the attention of the reader and the author from the substance of the issue. We maintain that it would be wrong to speak of the economic unachievability of self-determination in the same sense as we speak of the unachievability of labor money under capitalism. Not a single example of such unachievability can be cited. Kievsky tacitly admits we're correct on this point when he shifts to another interpretation of unachievability. Why does he not do so directly? Why does he not openly and precisely formulate his proposition? Quote, self-determination, while achievable in the sense that it is economically possible under capitalism, contradicts development and is therefore either reactionary or merely an exception. Unquote. He does not do so because a clear formulation of this counter-proposition would immediately expose its author, and he therefore tries to conceal it. The law of economic concentration, of the victory of large-scale production over small, is recognized in our own and the Erfurt programs. Kievsky conceals the fact that nowhere is the law of political or state concentration recognized. If it were the same kind of law, if there were such a law, then why should not Kievsky formulate it and suggest that it be added to our program? Is it right for him to leave us with a bad, incomplete program, considering that he has discovered this new law of state concentration, which is of practical significance since it would rid our program of erroneous conclusions? Kievsky does not formulate that law, does not suggest that it be added to our program, because he has the hazy feeling that if he did, he would be making himself a laughingstock. Everyone would laugh at this amusing imperialist economism if it were expressed openly, and if, parallel with the law that small-scale production is ousted by large-scale production, there were presented another, quote, law, connected with the first, or existing side-by-side -side with it, of small states being ousted by big ones. To explain this, we shall put only one question to Kievsky. Why is it that economists, without question marks, do not speak of the disintegration of the modern trusts or big banks, or of the possibility and achievability of such disintegration? Why is it that even the, quote, imperialist economist, in quotation marks, is obliged to admit that the disintegration of big states is both possible and achievable, and not only in general, but, for example, the cessation of small nationalities, please note, from Russia, Section E, Chapter 2, Kievsky's article. Lastly, to show even more clearly the lengths to which our author goes and to warn him, let us note the following. We all accept the law of large-scale production ousting small-scale production, but no one is afraid to describe a specific instance of small-scale industry prevailing over large-scale industry as a reactionary phenomenon. No opponent of self-determination has yet ventured to describe as reactionary Norway's secession from Sweden, though we raised the question in our literature as early as 1914. Large-scale production is unachievable if, for instance, hand-worked machines remain. The idea of a mechanical factory 
disintegrating into handicrafts production is utterly absurd. The imperialist tendency toward big empires is fully achievable, and in practice is often achieved in the form of an imperialist alliance of sovereign and independent, politically independent, states. Such an alliance is possible and is encountered not only in the form of an economic merger of the finance capital of two countries, but also in the form of military cooperation in an imperialist war. National struggle, national insurrection, national secession are fully achievable and are met with in practice under imperialism. They are even more pronounced, for imperialism does not halt the development of capitalism and the growth of democratic tendencies among the mass of the population. On the contrary, it accentuates the antagonism between their democratic aspirations and the anti-democratic tendency of the trusts. It is only from the point of view of imperialist economism, i.e. caricaturized Marxism, that one can ignore, for instance, the specific aspect of imperialist policy. On the one hand, the present imperialist war offers examples of how the force of financial ties and economic interests draws a small, politically independent state into the struggle of the great powers, Britain and Portugal. On the other hand, the violation of democracy with regard to small nations, much weaker both economically and politically, than their imperialist patrons, either leads to revolt, like Ireland, or to defection of whole regiments to the enemy, the Czechs. In this situation, it is not only achievable from the point of view of finance capital, but sometimes even profitable for the trusts, for their imperialist policy, for their imperialist war, to allow individual small nations as much democratic freedom as they can, right down to political independence, so as not to risk damaging their own military operations. To overlook the peculiarity of political and strategic relationships, and to repeat indiscriminately a word learned by rote, imperialism is anything but Marxism. On Norway, Kievsky tells us firstly that she, quote, had always been an independent state, unquote. That is not true, and can only be explained by the author's Bershakosa carelessness and his disregard of political issues. Norway was not an independent state prior to 1905, though she enjoyed a very large measure of autonomy. Sweden recognized Norway's political independence only after her secession. If Norway had always been an independent state, then the Swedish government would not have informed the other powers on October 26, 1905, that it had recognized Norway's independence. Secondly, Kievsky cites a number of statements to prove that Norway looked to the West and Sweden to the East, that in one country, mainly British and in the other German, finance capital was, quote, at work, etc., from this he draws the triumphant conclusion, quote, this example, Norway, neatly fits into our pattern, unquote. There you have a sample of the logic of imperialist economism. Our theses point out that finance capital can dominate in any, even independent country, and all the arguments about self-determination being unachievable from the point of view of finance capital are therefore sheer confusion. We are given data confirming our proposition about the part foreign finance capital played in Norway before, and after her secession. And these data are supposed to refute our proposition. Dilating on finance capital in order to disregard political issues. Is that the way to discuss politics? No. Political issues do not disappear because of economism's faulty logic. British finance capital was at work in Norway before and after secession. German finance capital was at work in Poland prior to her secession from Russia and will continue to work there no matter what political status Poland enjoys. That is so elementary that it's embarrassing to have to repeat it. But what can one do if the ABC is forgotten? Does this dispense with the political question of Norway's status, with her having been part of Sweden, with the attitude of the workers when the secession issue arose? Kievsky evades these questions because they hit hard at the economists. But these questions were posed and are posed by life itself. Life itself posed the question, could a Swedish worker who did not recognize Norway's right to secession remain a member of the Social Democratic Party? He could not. The Swedish aristocrats wanted a war against Norway, and so did the clericals. That fact does not disappear because Kievsky has forgotten to read about it in the history of the Norwegian people. The Swedish worker could, while remaining a Social Democrat, urge the Norwegians to vote against secession. The Norwegian referendum on secession, held on August 13, 1905, resulted in 368,200 votes for secession and 184 against, with about 80% of the electorate taking part. But the Swedish worker, who, like the Swedish aristocracy and bourgeoisie, 
would deny the Norwegians the right to decide this question themselves, without the Swedes and irrespective of their will, would have been a social chauvinist and a miscreant that the Social Democratic Party could not tolerate in its ranks. That is how Section 9 of our party program should be applied. But our imperialist economist tries to jump over this clause. You cannot jump over it, gentlemen, without falling into the embrace of chauvinism. And what of the Norwegian worker? Was it his duty, from the internationalist point of view, to vote for secession? Certainly not. He could have voted against secession and remained a social democrat. He would have been betraying his duty as a member of the Social Democratic Party only if he had proffered a helping hand to a black hundred, extreme reactionary Swedish worker, opposed to Norway's freedom of secession. Comment, that is, Marxists must support the right to secede and the decision on the part of a nation to do that or not based on their own decision because it's ultimately their life, the life of their nation that is at stake, whether or not they personally agree with it. So it's like supporting, as Lenin says elsewhere, the right of couples to get divorced. That doesn't mean that every couple should get divorced in every circumstance. And in fact, there could be a particular circumstance where somebody who supports the right to divorce might suggest to a particular couple thinking of divorcing that they should actually try a different path. But they're not allowed to forcibly block it. So that's the situation with secession and Marxism, very clearly outlined. We did a whole series of war and nationalism texts by Lenin that go over this point time and time again, so he really wrote a lot on that. Continuing, some people refuse to see this elementary difference in the position of the Norwegian and Swedish worker, but they expose themselves when they evade this most concrete of political question, which we squarely put to them. They remain silent, try to wriggle out, and in that way surrender their position. To prove that the Norwegian issue can arise in Russia, we deliberately advance this proposition. In circumstances of a purely military and strategic nature, a separate Polish state is fully achievable even now. Kievsky wants to discuss that and remain silent. Let us add this. Finland, too, out of purely military and strategic considerations, and given a certain outcome of the present imperialist war, for instance, Sweden joining the Germans and the latter's semi-victory, can become a separate state without undermining the achievability of even a single operation of finance capital, without making unachievable the buying up of Finnish railway and industrial shares. Footnote from Lenin, given one outcome of the present war, the formation of new states in Europe, Polish, Finnish, etc., is fully achievable without in any way disturbing the conditions for the development of imperialism and its power. On the contrary, this would increase the influence contacts, and pressure of finance capital. But given another outcome, the formation of new states in Hungary, Chechia, etc., is likewise achievable. The British imperialists are already planning this second outcome in anticipation of their victory. The imperialist era does not destroy either the striving for national political independence or its achievability within the bounds of world imperialist relationships. Outside these bounds, however, a Republican Russia or in general, any major democratic transformations anywhere else in the world, are unachievable without a series of revolutions and are unstable without socialism. Kievsky has wholly and completely failed to understand the relation of imperialism to democracy. Back to the text. Kievsky seeks salvation from unpleasant political issues in an amazing phrase which is amazingly characteristic of all his arguments. Quote, at any moment, that is literally what he says at the end of section C, chapter 1. The sword of Damocles can strike and put an end to the existence of a, quote, independent workshop, unquote. A little hint there at Sweden and Norway. That presumably is genuine Marxism, a separate Norwegian state whose secession from Sweden the Swedish government describes as a, quote, revolutionary measure, has been in existence only some 10 years. Is there any point in examining the political issues that follow from this if we have read Hilferding's Finance Capital and understood it in the sense that at any moment, if we're to exaggerate, then let's go the whole hog, a small state might vanish? Is there any point in drawing attention to the fact that we've perverted Marxism into economism, that we have turned our policy into a rehash of the speeches of case-hardened Russian chauvinists? What a mistake the Russian workers must have made in 1905 in seeking a republic. Finance capital had already been mobilized against it in France, England, etc., and at any moment 
the sword of Damocles could have struck it down if it had ever come into being. Quote, the demand for national self-determination is not utopian in the minimum program. It does not contradict social development, inasmuch as its achievement would not halt that development. Unquote. That passage from Martov is challenged by Kievsky in the section in which he cites the statements about Norway. They prove again and again the generally known fact that Norway's self-determination and secession did not halt either the development of finance capital generally or expansion of its operation in particular, or the buying up of Norway by the English. There have been Bolsheviks among us, Aleksinsky in 1908-10, to 10, for instance, who argued with Martov precisely at a time when Martov was right. God save us from such allies. Section 5. Monism and Dualism Reproaching us for, quote, interpreting the demand dualistically, P. Kievsky writes, quote, monistic action of the international is replaced by dualistic propaganda, unquote. That sounds quite Marxist and materialistic. Monistic action is contrasted to dualistic propaganda. Unfortunately, closer examination reveals that it is verbal monism, like the monism of Deering. Quote, if I include a shoe brush in the unity mammals, Engels wrote, exposing Deering's monism, this does not help it to get mammary glands, unquote. This means that only such things, qualities, phenomena, and actions that are a unity in objective reality can be declared a unity. It is this detail that our author overlooks. He thinks we are dualists. First, because what we demand primarily of the workers of the oppressed nations, this refers to the national question only, differs from what we demand of the workers of the oppressor nations. To determine whether P. Kievsky's monism is the same as Deering's, let us examine objective realities. Is the actual condition of the workers in the oppressor and in the oppressed nations the same from the standpoint of the national question? No, it's not the same. 1. Economically, the difference is that sections of the working class in the oppressor nations receive crumbs from the super profits the bourgeoisie of these nations obtains by extra exploitation of the workers of the oppressed nations. Besides, economic statistics show that here a larger percentage of the workers become straw bosses than is in the case in the oppressed nations. A larger percentage rise to the labor aristocracy. That is a fact. To a certain degree, the workers of the oppressor nation are partners of their own bourgeoisie in plundering the workers and the mass of the population of the oppressed nations. So I want to comment here to just pause and accentuate the labor aristocracy topic. So here's a quote from Lenin. Yes, for those who are underplaying it or get triggered when people mention it, yes, the concept of a labor aristocracy is real. The MIA editor also throws in. See, for instance, Our Witch's book, H-O-U-R-W-I-C-H, on immigration and the condition of the working class in America, titled Immigration and Labor. So there it is, Lenin talking about it. Yes, the labor aristocracy is real. It's something that you need to be aware of. However, Let's not overplay it either. What does Lenin say? To a certain degree, and certain degree is italicized for emphasis, the workers of the oppressor nation are partners of their own bourgeoisie in plundering the workers and the mass of the population of the oppressed nations. So Lenin right there is really emphasizing to a certain degree, okay? So that's not the only dimension of this. And really, what is the extent? Well, the first sentence Lenin says, economically, the difference is that sections of the working class in the oppressor nations receive what? Receive crumbs from the super profits the bourgeoisie of these nations obtains by extra exploitation of the workers of the oppressed nations. So Lenin says crumbs is what the working class in the oppressor nations receive, some extra crumbs. Now, can you buy off some people with crumbs? Can you prevent some kind of international solidarity from emerging with crumbs? Yeah, and some people. As Lenin notes, economic statistics show that a larger percentage of the workers in the oppressor nations become straw bosses than is the case in the oppressed nations. But let's keep it in check here. I see people underplaying or overplaying that to like ridiculous degrees. And I think that some of the conclusions and statements that people reach as extensions of those ridiculous exaggerations um, just get tangled and nonsensical. Anyway, continuing. Two, politically... So the first one was economically. Two, politically, the difference is that, compared with the workers of the oppressed nations, they occupy a privileged position in many spheres of political life. Three, 
ideologically or spiritually. The difference is that they are taught, at school and in life, disdain and contempt for the workers of the oppressed nations. Very true. This has been experienced, for example, by every great Russian, that is to say Russian proper rather than uh, somebody who is from the more outlying regions of the Russian Empire, who has been brought up or who has lived among great Russians. So the bourgeoisie teach a sort of supremacy or belligerent nationalism, chauvinism in other words, and not just with respect to other oppressor nations, though there's competition there as well, though also the feeling that, ah, in the end we're partners, because again, that's generally the feeling of the bourgeoisie, but to look down on people in the exploited countries specifically. Continuing, thus, all along the line, there are differences in objective reality, i.e. dualism, in the objective world that is independent of the will and consciousness of individuals. In other words, social reality. That being so, how are we to regard P. Kievsky's assertion about the monistic action of the international? It's a hollow, high-sounding phrase and no more. In real life, the international is composed of workers divided into oppressor and oppressed nations. If its action is to be monistic, its propaganda must not be the same for both. That is how we should regard the matter in the light of real, not Duringian monism, Marxist materialism. Comment, so what's Lenin saying here? If its action is to be monistic, unified, its propaganda must not be the same for both, because workers are divided into oppressor and oppressed nations. Well, You've got different knowledge, attitudes, values, and beliefs in the different nations. You've also got a different material position. So these are the three things that Lenin was just talking about. Economically, there are differences. Politically, there are differences. And ideologically, there are differences. So the workers in each of those different situations need to be addressed differently because of the different conditions and, again, the different material positions that the workers are in. Only then can you get unified action between the two groups. Lenin gives an example. An example. We cited the example of Norway in the legal press over two years ago, and no one has challenged it. In this concrete case taken from life, the action of the Norwegian and Swedish workers was monistic, unified, internationalist, only because and insofar as the Swedish workers unconditionally champion Norway's freedom to secede while the Norwegian workers raised the question of secession only conditionally. Had the Swedish workers not supported Norway's freedom of secession unconditionally, they would have been chauvinists, accomplices of the chauvinist Swedish landlords, who wanted to keep Norway by force, by war. Had the Norwegian workers not raised the question of secession conditionally, i.e. allowing even Social Democratic Party members to conduct propaganda and vote against secession, they would have failed in their internationalist duty and would have sunk to narrow, bourgeois Norwegian nationalism. Why? Because the secession was being affected by the bourgeoisie, not by the proletariat. Because the Norwegian bourgeoisie, as every other, always strives to drive a wedge between the workers of its own and an alien country. Because for the class-conscious workers, every democratic demand, including self-determination, is subordinated to the supreme interests of socialism. For example, if Norway's secession from Sweden had created the certainty or probability of war between Britain and Germany, the Norwegian workers, for that reason alone, would have had to oppose secession. The Swedish workers would have had the right and the opportunity, without ceasing to be socialists, to agitate against secession, but only if they had waged a systematic, consistent, and constant struggle against the Swedish government for Norway's freedom to secede. Otherwise, the Norwegian workers and people would not and could not accept the advice of the Swedish workers as sincere. The trouble with the opponents of self-determination is that they confine themselves to lifeless abstractions fearing to analyze to the end a single concrete real-life instance. Our concrete statement in the theses that a new Polish state is quite achievable now, given a definite combination of purely military, strategic conditions, has not been challenged either by the Poles or by P. Kievsky, but no one wanted to ponder the conclusions that follow from this tacit admission that we were right. And what follows, obviously, is that internationalist propaganda cannot be the same for the Russians and the Poles if it is to educate both for monistic action. The great Russian and German worker is in duty, bound unconditionally, to insist on Poland's freedom to secede. Otherwise he will, in fact, now be the lackey of Nicholas II or Hindenburg. The Polish worker could insist on secession only conditionally, because to speculate as do the frosty on the victory of one or the other imperialist bourgeoisie, is tantamount to becoming its lackey. 
Failure to understand this difference, which is a prerequisite for monistic action of the international, is about the same as failing to understand why monistic action against the Tsarist army near Moscow, say, requires that the revolutionary forces march west from Nizhny Novgorod and east from Smolensk. Comment, I think that that is a very good metaphor, actually. So monistic action, both are going to go into Moscow, but since they're in different starting places, they have to move in different directions, but they wind up in the right place. By the way, footnote, the Frosty Revolutionary Faction was the right wing of the Polish Socialist Party, PSP, a reformist nationalist party founded in 1892 and led by Pilsudski. While advocating independence for Poland, the PSP conducted separatist nationalist propaganda among the Polish workers, endeavoring to discourage them from joint struggle with the Russian workers against the autocracy and capitalism. In 1906, the party split into the left PSP and right PSP, or Frosty. The latter continued the PSP nationalist and chauvinist policy before, during, and after the First World War. Back to the text. Second, our new exponent of Duringian monism reproaches us for not striving to achieve, quote, the closest organizational unity of the various national sections of the international, unquote, in the event of a social revolution. Under socialism, P. Kievsky writes, self-determination becomes superfluous, since the state itself ceases to exist. That's meant as an argument against us, but in our theses, we clearly and definitely say, in three lines, the last three lines of section one, that, quote, democracy too is a form of state which must disappear when the state disappears, unquote. It is precisely this truism that P. Kievsky repeats to, quote, refute us, of course, on several pages of his section R, chapter one, and repeats it in a distorted way. Quote, we picture to ourselves, he writes, and have always pictured the socialist system as a strictly democratic, centralized system of economy in which the state, as the apparatus for the domination of one part of the population over the other, disappears, unquote. This is confusion, because democracy, too, is domination of one part of the population over the other. It, too, is a form of state. Our author obviously does not understand what is meant by the withering away of the state after the victory of socialism and what this process requires. The main point, however, is his objections regarding the era of the social revolution. He calls us, quote, Talmudists of self-determination, what a frightening epithet, and adds, quote, We picture this process, the social revolution, as the united action of the proletarians of all countries, who wipe out the frontiers of the bourgeois state, who tear down the frontier posts, in addition to wiping out the frontiers, who blow up national unity and establish class unity, unquote. The wrath of this stern judge of the Talmudists notwithstanding, we must say there are many words here, but no ideas. The social revolution cannot be the united action of the proletarians of all countries, for the simple reason that most of the countries and the majority of the world's population have not even reached or have only just reached the capitalist stage of development. We stated this in section 6 of our theses, but P. Kievsky, because of lack of attention or inability to think, did, quote, not notice that we included this section for a definite purpose, namely to refute caricature distortions of Marxism. Only the advanced countries of Western Europe and North America have matured for socialism. And in Engel's letter to Kautsky, Spornik Socialdemokrata, September 12, 1882, Kievsky will find a concrete illustration of the real and not merely promised idea that to dream of the united action of the proletarians of all countries means postponing socialism to the Greek kalends, i.e. forever. Socialism will be achieved by the united action of the proletarians, not of all, but of a minority of countries, those that have reached the advanced capitalist stage of development. The cause of Kievsky's error lies in failure to understand that. In these advanced countries, England, France, Germany, etc., the national problem was solved long ago. National unity outlived its purpose long ago. Objectively, there are no general national tasks to be accomplished. Hence, only in these countries is it possible now to blow up national unity and establish class unity. The undeveloped countries are a different matter. They embrace the whole of Eastern Europe and all the colonies and semi-colonies and are dealt with in section 6 of the theses second and third type countries. In those areas, as a rule, there still exist oppressed and capitalistically undeveloped nations. Objectively, these nations still have general national tasks to accomplish, namely democratic tasks, the tasks of overthrowing foreign oppression. 
Engel cited India as an example of such nations, stating that she might perform a revolution against Victoria's socialism, for Engels was remote from the preposterous imperialist economism which imagines that having achieved victory in the advanced countries, the proletariat will automatically, without definite democratic measures, abolish national oppression everywhere. The victorious proletariat will reorganize the countries in which it has triumphed, but that cannot be done all at once, nor indeed can the bourgeoisie be vanquished all at once. We deliberately emphasize this in our theses, and Kievsky has again failed to stop and think why we stress this point in connection with the national question. While the proletariat of the advanced countries is overthrowing the bourgeoisie and repelling its attempts at counter-revolution, the undeveloped and oppressed nations do not just wait, do not cease to exist, do not disappear. If they take advantage even of such a bourgeois imperialist crisis as the war of 1915-16, to 16, a minor crisis compared with social revolution, let's read that again, a bourgeois imperialist crisis as the war of 1915-16, to 16, a minor crisis compared with social revolution, to rise in revolt, the colonies, Ireland, there can be no doubt that they will all the more readily take advantage of the great crisis of civil war in the advanced countries to rise in revolt. The social revolution can only come in the form of an epoch in which are combined civil war by the proletariat against the bourgeoisie in the advanced countries and a whole series of democratic and revolutionary movements, including the national liberation movement, in the undeveloped, backward, and oppressed nations. Why? Because capitalism develops unevenly, and objective reality gives us highly developed capitalist nations side by side with a number of economically slightly developed or totally undeveloped nations. Pikievsky has absolutely failed to analyze the objective conditions of social revolution from the standpoint of the economic maturity of various countries. His reproach that we invent instances in which to apply self-determination is therefore an attempt to lay the blame at the wrong door. With a zeal worthy of a better cause, Kievsky repeatedly quotes Marx and Engels to the effect that one must not invent things out of his own head, but use his head to discover in the existing material conditions, the means that will free humanity of social evils. When I read those oft-repeated quotations, I cannot help recalling the late and unlamented economists who just as tediously harped on their, quote, new discovery that capitalism had triumphed in Russia. Kievsky wants to smite us with these quotations. He claims that we invent out of our own heads the conditions for applying self-determination in the epoch of imperialism, but we find the following incautious admission in his own article, quote, The very fact that we are opposed, author's italics, to defense of the fatherland shows most clearly that we will actively resist suppression of a national uprising, for we shall thereby be combating imperialism, our mortal enemy, unquote. To criticize an author, to answer him, one has to quote in full at least the main propositions of his article, but in all of Kievsky's propositions, you will find that every sentence contains two or three errors or illogicalities that distort Marxism. 1. He is unaware that a national uprising is also defense of the fatherland. A little thought, however, will make it perfectly clear that this is so, since every nation in revolt defends itself, its language, its territory, its fatherland against the oppressor nation. All national oppression calls forth the resistance of the broad masses of the people, and the resistance of a nationally oppressed population always tends to national revolt. Not infrequently, notably in Austria and Russia, we find the bourgeoisie of the oppressed nations talking of national revolt, while in practice it enters into reactionary compacts with the bourgeoisie of the oppressor nation behind the backs of and against its own people. In such cases, the criticism of revolutionary Marxists should be directed not against the national movement, but against its degradation, vulgarization, against the tendency to reduce it to a petty squabble. Incidentally, very many Austrian and Russian social democrats overlook this, and in their legitimate hatred of the petty, vulgar, and sordid national squabbles, disputes and scuffles over the question, for instance, of which language shall have precedence in two-language street signs, refuse to support the national struggle. We shall not support a Republican farce in, say, the Principality of Monaco, or the, quote, Republican adventurism of generals in the small states of South America or some Pacific island. But that does not mean that it would be permissible to abandon the Republican slogan for serious democratic and socialist movements. We should, and do, 
ridicule the sordid national squabbles and haggling in Russia and Austria. But that does not mean that it would be permissible to deny support to a national uprising or a serious popular struggle against national oppression. 2. If national uprisings are impossible in the imperialist era, Kievsky has no right to speak of them. If they are possible, all his fine-spun talk about monism and our inventing examples of self-determination under imperialism, etc., falls to pieces. Kievsky defeats his own arguments. If we actively resist suppression of a national uprising, a case which P. Kievsky himself considers possible, what does this mean? It means that the action is twofold, or dualistic, to employ the philosophical term as incorrectly as our author does. A. First, it's the action of the nationally oppressed proletariat and peasantry jointly with the nationally oppressed bourgeoisie against the oppressor nation. B. Second, it is the action of the proletariat, or of its class-conscious section, in the oppressor nation against the bourgeoisie of that nation and all the elements that follow it. The innumerable phrases against a national bloc, national illusions, the poison of nationalism, against fanning national hatred and the like, to which P. Kievsky resorts, prove to be meaningless, for when he advises the proletariat of the oppressor countries, which, be it remembered, he regards as a serious force, quote, actively to resist suppression of a national uprising, he thereby fans national hatred and supports the establishment of a bloc with the bourgeoisie by the workers of the oppressed nations. 3. If national uprisings are possible under imperialism, so are national wars. There's no material political difference between the two. Military historians are perfectly right when they put rebellions in the same category as wars. Kievsky has unwittingly refuted not only himself, but also Unius, this was Rosa Luxemburg's pen name, and the Internationale group who deny the possibility of national wars under imperialism. And this denial is the only conceivable theoretical ground for denying self-determination of nations under imperialism. 4. For what is a national uprising? It's an uprising aimed at the achievement of political independence of the oppressed nation, i.e., the establishment of a separate national state. If the proletariat of the oppressor nation is a serious force, in the imperialist era, as our author rightly assumes, does not its determination, quote, actively to resist suppression of a national uprising, imply assistance in creating a separate national state? Of course it does. Though he denies the achievability of self-determination, our brave author now argues that the class-conscious proletariat of the advanced countries must assist in achieving this, quote, unachievable goal. 5. Why must we actively resist suppression of a national uprising? Pikievsky advances only one reason, quote, we shall thereby be combating imperialism, our mortal enemy. All the strength of this argument lies in the strong word mortal. And this is in keeping with his penchant for strong words instead of strong arguments. High-sounding phrases like driving a stake into the quivering body of the bourgeoisie and similar Alexinsky flourishes. But this Kievsky argument is wrong. Imperialism is as much our mortal enemy as is capitalism. That is so. No Marxist will forget, however, that capitalism is progressive compared with feudalism. And imperialism is progressive compared with pre-monopoly capitalism. Hence, it is not every struggle against imperialism that we should support. Let's repeat that. Hence, it is not every struggle against imperialism that we should support. We will not support a struggle of the reactionary classes against imperialism. Right-wing populists, paleocons, Ron Paul types, take note. We will not support a struggle of the reactionary classes against imperialism. We will not support an uprising of the reactionary classes against imperialism and capitalism. Consequently, once the author admits the need to support an uprising of an oppressed nation, and actively resisting suppression means supporting the uprising, he also admits that a national uprising is progressive, that the establishment of a separate and new state, of new frontiers, etc., resulting from a successful uprising, is progressive. In none of his political arguments is the author consistent. The Irish Rebellion of 1916, which took place after our theses had appeared in number two of Forboda, proved incidentally that it was not idle to speak of the possibility of national uprisings even in Europe. Section 6. The Other Political Issues Raised and Distorted by P. Kievsky. Liberation of the colonies, we stated in our theses, means self-determination of nations. Europeans often forget that colonial peoples too are nations, but to tolerate this forgetfulness is to tolerate chauvinism. P. Kievsky objects. 
In the pure type of colonies, quote, there is no proletariat in the proper sense of the term. For whom, then, is the self-determination slogan meant? For the colonial bourgeoisie? For the fellas? For the peasants? Certainly not. It is absurd for socialists to demand self-determination for the colonies, for it is absurd in general to advance the slogans of a workers' party for countries where there are no workers, unquote. Pikievsky's anger and his denunciation of our view as absurd notwithstanding, we make bold to submit that his arguments are erroneous. Only the late and unlamented economists believe that the slogans of a workers' party are issued only for workers. Footnote from Lenin, Pikievsky would do well to reread what A. Martinov and company wrote in 1899 to 1901. He would find many of his own arguments there. Back to the text. No, these slogans are issued for the whole of the laboring population, for the entire people. The democratic part of our program, Kievsky has given no thought to its significance in general, is addressed specifically to the whole people, and that is why in it we speak of the, quote, people. Another footnote from Lenin, some curious opponents of self-determination of nations try to refute our views with the argument that nations are divided into classes. Our customary reply to these caricature Marxists is that the democratic part of our program speaks of government by the people. Back to the text. The colonial and semi-colonial nations, we said, account for 1,000 million people, or a billion people, and Pikievsky has not taken the trouble to refute that concrete statement. Of these 1 billion people, more than 700 million, China, India, Persia, Egypt, live in countries where there are workers. But even with regard to colonial countries where there are no workers, only slave owners and slaves, etc., the demand for self-determination, far from being absurd, is obligatory for every Marxist. And if he gave the matter a little thought, Kievsky would probably realize this, and also that self-determination is always advanced for two nations, the oppressed and the oppressing. Another of Kievsky's objections, quote, for that reason, we limit ourselves in respect to the colonies to a negative slogan, i.e. to the demand socialists present to their governments, get out of the colonies. Unachievable within the framework of capitalism, this demand serves to intensify the struggle against imperialism, but does not contradict the trend of development, for a socialist society will not possess colonies, unquote. The author's inability or reluctance to give the slightest thought to the theoretical contents of political slogans is simply amazing. Are we to believe that the use of a propaganda phrase instead of a theoretically precise political term alters matters? To say, get out of the colonies, is to evade a theoretical analysis and hide behind propaganda phrases. For every one of our party propagandists, in referring to the Ukraine, Poland, Finland, etc., is fully entitled to demand of the czarist government, his, quote, own government, get out of Finland, etc. However, the intelligent propagandist will understand that we must not advance either positive or negative slogans for the sole purpose of intensifying the struggle. Only men of the Aleksinsky type could insist that the negative slogan, get out of the Black Hundred Duma, was justified by the desire to intensify the struggle against a certain evil. Intensification of the struggle is an empty phrase of the subjectivists, who forget the Marxist requirement that every slogan be justified by a precise analysis of economic realities, the political situation, and the political significance of the slogan. It is embarrassing to have to drive this home, but what can one do? We know the Aleksinsky habit of cutting short a theoretical discussion of a theoretical question by propaganda outcries. It is a bad habit. The slogan, get out of the colonies, has one, and only one, political and economic content. Freedom of secession for the colonial nations. Freedom to establish a separate state. If, as Pikievsky believes, the general laws of imperialism prevent the self-determination of nations, and make it a utopia, illusion, etc., etc., then how can one, without stopping to think, make an exception from these general laws for most of the nations of the world? Obviously, Pikievsky's theory is a caricature of theory. Commodity production and capitalism, and the connecting threads of finance capital, exist in the vast majority of colonial countries. How then can we urge the imperialist countries, their governments, to get out of the colonies if, from the standpoint of commodity production, capitalism, and imperialism, this is an unscientific and utopian demand, refuted even by Lynch, Kunau, and the rest? There's not even a shadow of thought in the author's argumentation. He has given no thought to the fact that the liberation of the colonies is unrealizable 
only in the sense of being unrealizable without a series of revolutions. He has given no thought to the fact that it is realizable in conjunction with a socialist revolution in Europe. He has given no thought to the fact that a socialist society will not possess not only colonies, but subject nations in general. He has given no thought to the fact that on the question under discussion, there is no economic or political difference between Russia's possession of Poland or Turkestan. He has given no thought to the fact that a socialist society will wish to get out of the colonies only in the sense of granting them the free right to secede, but definitely not in the sense of recommending secession. And for this differentiation between the right to secede and the recommendation to secede, Pikievsky condemns us as jugglers. And to quote-unquote scientifically substantiate that verdict in the eyes of the workers, he writes, quote, What is a worker to think? When he asks a propagandist how the proletariat should regard political independence for the Ukraine and gets this answer, socialists are working for the right to secede, but their propaganda is against secession, unquote. I believe I can give a fairly accurate reply to that question, namely, every sensible worker will think that Kievsky is not capable of thinking. Every sensible worker will think, here we have P. Kievsky telling us workers to shout, get out of the colonies. In other words, we great Russian workers must demand from our government that it get out of Mongolia, Turkestan, Persia. English workers must demand that the English government get out of Egypt, India, Persia, etc. But does this mean that we proletarians wish to separate ourselves from the Egyptian workers and fellas, fellas basically means peasants, from the Mongolian, Turkestan, or Indian workers and peasants? Does it mean that we advise the laboring masses of the colonies to separate from the class-conscious European proletariat? Nothing of the kind. Now, as always, we stand and shall continue to stand for the closest association and merging of the class-conscious workers of the advanced countries with the workers, peasants, and slaves of all the oppressed countries. We have always advised and shall continue to advise all the oppressed classes and all the oppressed countries, colonies included, not to separate from us, but to form the closest possible ties and merge with us. We demand from our governments that they quit the colonies, or, to put it in precise political terms, rather than in agitational outcries, that they grant the colonies full freedom of secession, the genuine right to self-determination, and we ourselves are sure to implement this right and grant this freedom as soon as we capture power. We demand this from existing governments, and will do this when we are the government, not in order to recommend secession, but on the contrary, in order to facilitate and accelerate the democratic association and merging of nations. We shall exert every effort to foster association and merger with the Mongolians, Persians, Indians, Egyptians. We believe it is our duty and in our interest to do this, for otherwise, socialism in Europe will not be secure. We shall endeavor to render these nations, more backward and oppressed than we are, quote, disinterested cultural assistance, to borrow the happy expression of the Polish Social Democrats. In other words, we will help them pass to the use of machinery, to the lightening of labor, to democracy, to socialism. If we demand freedom of secession for the Mongolians, Persians, Egyptians, and all other oppressed and unequal nations without exception, we do so not because we favor secession, but only because we stand for free, voluntary association and merging as distinct from forcible association. That is the only reason. And in this respect, the only difference between the Mongolian or Egyptian peasants and workers and their Polish or Finnish counterparts is, in our view, that the latter are more developed, more experienced politically than the great Russians, more economically prepared, etc., and for that reason will in all likelihood very soon convince their peoples that it is unwise to extend their present legitimate hatred of the great Russians, for their role of hangman, to the socialist workers and to a socialist Russia. They will convince them that economic expediency and internationalist and democratic instinct and consciousness demand the earliest association of all nations and their merging in a socialist society. And since the Poles and Finns are highly cultured people, they will, in all probability, very soon come to see the correctness of this attitude, and the possible secession of Poland and Finland after the triumph of socialism will therefore be only of short duration. The incomparably less cultured fellows, Mongolians, and Persians might secede for a longer period, but we shall try to shorten it by disinterested cultural assistance as indicated above. There is no other difference in our attitude to the Poles and Mongolians, nor can there be. There is no contradiction, nor can there be, between our propaganda of freedom of secession and our firm resolve to implement that freedom when we are the government, 
and our propaganda of association and merging of nations. That is what, we feel sure, every sensible worker, every genuine socialist and internationalist will think of our controversy with P. Kievsky. Footnote from Lenin. Evidently, Kievsky simply repeated the slogan, Get out of the colonies, advanced by certain German and Dutch Marxists, without considering not only its theoretical content and implications, but also the specific features of Russia. It is pardonable, to a certain extent, for a Dutch or German Marxist to confine himself to the slogan, Get out of the colonies. For, first, the typical form of national oppression, in the case of most West European countries, is oppression of the colonies. And second, the very term colony has an especially clear, graphic, and vital meaning for West European countries. But what of Russia? Its peculiarity lies precisely in the fact that the difference between our colonies and our oppressed nations is not clear, not concrete, and not vitally felt. For a Marxist writing in, say, German, it might be pardonable to overlook this peculiarity of Russia. For Kievsky, it is unpardonable. The sheer absurdity of trying to discover some serious difference between oppressed nations and colonies in the case of Russia should be especially clear to a Russian socialist who wants not simply to repeat, but to think. Back to the text. Running through the article is Kievsky's basic doubt. Why advocate and, when we're in power, implement the freedom of nations to secede, considering that the trend of development is toward the merging of nations? For the same reason, we reply, that we advocate and, when in power, will implement the dictatorship of the proletariat, though the entire trend of development is toward the abolition of coercive domination of one part of society over another. Dictatorship is domination of one part of society over the rest of society, and domination, moreover, that rests directly on coercion. Dictatorship of the proletariat, the only consistently revolutionary class, is necessary to overthrow the bourgeoisie and repel its attempts at counter-revolution. The question of proletarian dictatorship is of such overriding importance that he who denies the need for such dictatorship, or recognizes it only in words, cannot be a member of the Social Democratic Party. However, it cannot be denied that in individual cases, by way of exception, for instance, in some small country, after the social revolution has been accomplished in a neighboring big country, peaceful surrender of power by the bourgeoisie is possible, if it is convinced that resistance is hopeless, and if it prefers to save its skin. It's much more likely, of course, that even in small states, socialism will not be achieved without civil war, and for that reason the only program of international social democracy must be recognition of civil war, though violence is, of course, alien to our ideals. The same, mutatis mutandis, with the necessary alterations, is applicable to nations. We favor their merger, but now there can be no transition from forcible merger and annexation to voluntary merger without freedom of secession. We recognize, and quite rightly, the predominance of the economic factor, but to interpret it a la Kievsky is to make a caricature of Marxism. Even the trusts and banks of modern imperialism, though inevitable everywhere as part of developed capitalism, differ in their concrete aspects from country to country. There is a still greater difference, despite homogeneity and essentials, between political forms in the advanced imperialist countries, America, England, France, Germany. The same variety will manifest itself also in the path mankind will follow from the imperialism of today to the socialist revolution of tomorrow. All nations will arrive at socialism, this is inevitable, but all will do so in not exactly the same way. Each will contribute something of its own to some form of democracy, to some variety of the dictatorship of the proletariat, to the varying rate of socialist transformations in the different aspects of social life. There is nothing more primitive from the viewpoint of theory, or more ridiculous from that of practice, than to paint, quote, in the name of historical materialism, this aspect of the future in a monotonous gray. The result will be nothing more than Suzdal daubing, and even if reality were to show that prior to the first victory of the socialist proletariat, only one out of 500 of the nations now oppressed will win emancipation and secede, that prior to the final victory of the socialist proletariat the world over, i.e., during all the vicissitudes of the socialist revolution, also, only one out of 500 of the oppressed nations will secede for a very short time, even in that event we would be correct both from the theoretical and practical political standpoint, in advising the workers, already now, not to permit into their social democratic parties those socialists of the oppressor nations who do not recognize and do not advocate freedom of secession for all oppressed nations. 
for the fact is that we do not know and cannot know how many of the oppressed nations will in practice require secession in order to contribute something of their own to the different forms of democracy, the different forms of transition to socialism, and that the negation of freedom of secession now is theoretically false from beginning to end, and in practice amounts to servility to the chauvinists of the oppressing nations. This we know, see, and feel daily. Quote, we emphasize, Pikievsky writes in a footnote to the passage quoted above, that we fully support the demand against forcible annexation, unquote. But he makes no reply, not even by a single word, to our perfectly clear statement that this demand is tantamount to recognizing self-determination, that there can be no correct definition of the concept annexation unless it is seen in context with self-determination. Presumably, Kievsky believes that, in a discussion, it's enough to present one's arguments and demands without any supporting evidence. He continues, quote, We fully accept, in their negative formulation, a number of demands that tend to sharpen proletarian consciousness against imperialism, but there's absolutely no possibility of working out corresponding positive formulations on the basis of the existing system. Against war, yes, but not for a democratic peace, unquote. Wrong. Wrong from the first word to the last. Kievsky has read our resolution on pacifism and the peace slogan in the pamphlet Socialism and War, and even approved it, I believe, but obviously he did not understand it. We are for a democratic peace, only we warn the workers against the deception that such a peace is possible under the present bourgeois governments without a series of revolutions. As the resolution points out, we denounced as a deception of the workers the abstract advocacy of peace, i.e. one that does not take into account the real class nature, or specifically the imperialist nature, of the present governments in the belligerent countries. We definitely stated in the Social Democrat number 47 theses that if the revolution places our party in power during the present war, it will immediately propose a democratic peace to all the warring countries. Yet, anxious to convince himself and others that he is opposed only to self-determination, not to democracy in general, Kievsky ends up by asserting that we are, quote, not for a democratic peace. Curious logic. There is no need to dwell on all the other examples he cites, and no sense in wasting space on refuting them, for they're on the same level of naive and fallacious logic and can only make the reader smile. There is not, nor can there be, such a thing as a negative social democratic slogan that serves only to, quote, sharpen proletarian consciousness against imperialism, without at the same time offering a positive answer to the question of how social democracy will solve the problem when it assumes power. A negative slogan unconnected with a definite positive solution will not sharpen but dull consciousness, for such a slogan is a hollow phrase, mere shouting, meaningless declamation. Pikievsky does not understand the difference between negative slogans that stigmatize political evils and economic evils. The difference lies in the fact that certain economic evils are part of capitalism as such, whatever the political superstructure, and that it is impossible to eliminate them economically without eliminating capitalism itself. Not a single instance can be cited to disprove this. On the other hand, political evils represent a departure from democracy which, economically, is fully possible on the basis of the existing system, i.e. capitalism, and by way of exception is being implemented under capitalism, certain aspects in one country, other aspects in another. Again, what the author fails to understand is precisely the fundamental conditions necessary for the implementation of democracy in general. The same applies to the question of divorce. The reader will recall that it was first posed by Rosa Luxemburg in the discussion on the national question. She expressed the perfectly justified opinion that if we uphold autonomy within a state, for a definite region, area, etc., we must, as centralist social democrats, insist that all major national issues, and divorce legislation is one of them, should come within the jurisdiction of the central government and central parliament. This example clearly demonstrates that one cannot be a democrat and socialist without demanding full freedom of divorce now, because the lack of such freedom is additional oppression of the oppressed sex, though it should not be difficult to realize that recognition of the freedom to leave one's husband is not an invitation comment, let alone a command, to all wives to do so. P. Kievsky objects, quote, What would this right of divorce be like if in such cases, when the wife wants to leave the husband, she could not exercise her right, or if its exercise depended on the will of third parties, 
or worse still on the will of claimants to her affections, would we advocate the proclamation of such a right? Of course not. Unquote. That objection reveals complete failure to understand the relation between democracy in general and capitalism, the conditions that make it impossible for the oppressed classes to exercise their democratic rights are not the exception under capitalism. They're typical of the system. In most cases, the right of divorce will remain unrealizable under capitalism, for the oppressed sex is subjugated economically. No matter how much democracy there is under capitalism, the woman remains a domestic slave, a slave locked up in the bedroom, nursery, kitchen. The right to elect their own people's judges, officials, school teachers, jurymen, etc., is likewise in most cases unrealizable under capitalism precisely because of the economic subjection of the workers and peasants. The same applies to the democratic republic. Our program defines it as government by the people, though all social democrats know perfectly well that under capitalism, even in the most democratic republic, there's bound to be bribery of officials by the bourgeoisie and an alliance of stock exchange and the government. Only those who cannot think straight or have no knowledge of Marxism will conclude, so therefore there's no point in having a republic, no point in freedom of divorce, no point in democracy, no point in self-determination of nations. But Marxists know that democracy does not abolish class oppression. It only makes the class struggle more direct, wider, more open and pronounced, and that's what we need. The fuller the freedom of divorce, the clearer will women see that the source of their domestic slavery is capitalism, not lack of rights. The more democratic the system of government, the clearer will the workers see that the root evil is capitalism, not lack of rights. The fuller national equality, and it is not complete without freedom of secession, the clearer will the workers of the oppressed nation see that the cause of their oppression is capitalism, not lack of rights, etc. It must be said again and again. It's embarrassing to have to drive home the ABC of Marxism, but what is one to do if Kievsky does not know it? He discusses divorce in much the same way as one of the secretaries of the organizing committee abroad, Semkovsky, discussed it, if I remember rightly, in the Paris Golos. The Golos, or The Voice, was a Menshevik daily paper published in Paris from September 1914 to January 1915, with Trotsky playing a leading role in its editorship. It followed a centrist policy and, in the early days of the First World War, published El Martov's articles against the social chauvinists. Subsequently, Martov shifted to the right and the paper's policy changed in favor of the social chauvinists. Back to the text. His line of reasoning was that freedom of divorce is not, it's true, an invitation to all wives to leave their husbands. But if it's proved that all other husbands are better than yours, madam, then it amounts to one and the same thing. In taking that line of argument, Semkovsky forgot that crank thinking is not a violation of socialist or democratic principles. If Semkovsky were to tell a woman that all other husbands were better than hers, no one would regard this as violation of democratic principles. At most, people would say, well, there are bound to be big cranks in a big party. But if Semkovsky were to take it into his head to defend as a Democrat a person who opposed freedom of divorce and appealed to the courts, the police, or the church to prevent his wife leaving him, we feel sure that even most of Semkovsky's colleagues on the Secretariat abroad, though they're sorry socialists, would refuse to support him. Both Semkovsky and Kievsky, in their discussion of divorce, failed to understand the issue and avoid its substance, namely that under capitalism, the right of divorce, as all other democratic rights without exception, is conditional, restricted, formal, narrow, and extremely difficult to realize. Yet no self-respecting social democrat will consider anyone opposing the right of divorce a democrat, let alone a socialist. That's the crux of the matter. All democracy consists in the proclamation and realization of rights, which under capitalism are realizable only to a very small degree and only relatively. But without the proclamation of these rights, without a struggle to introduce them now, immediately, without training the masses in the spirit of the struggle, socialism is impossible. Having failed to understand that, Kievsky bypasses the central question that belongs to his special subject, namely, how will we social democrats abolish national oppression? He shunts the question aside with phrases about the world being drenched in blood, etc., though this has no bearing on the matter under discussion. This leaves only one single argument, the socialist revolution will solve everything, or the argument sometimes advanced by people who share his views, self-determination is impossible under capitalism, and superfluous under socialism. From the theoretical standpoint, that view is nonsensical. From the practical political standpoint, it's chauvinistic. 
it fails to appreciate the significance of democracy. For socialism is impossible without democracy, because one, the proletariat cannot perform the socialist revolution unless it prepares for it by the struggle for democracy. Two, victorious socialism cannot consolidate its victory and bring humanity to the withering away of the state without implementing full democracy. To claim that self-determination is superfluous under socialism is therefore just as nonsensical and just as hopelessly confusing as to claim that democracy is superfluous under socialism. Self-determination is no more impossible under capitalism and just as superfluous under socialism as democracy generally. The economic revolution will create the necessary prerequisites for eliminating all types of political oppression. Precisely for that reason, it's illogical and incorrect to reduce everything to the economic revolution, for the question is how to eliminate national oppression. It cannot be eliminated without an economic revolution. That's incontestable. But to limit ourselves to this is to lapse into absurd and wretched imperialist economism. We must carry out national equality, proclaim, formulate, and implement equal rights for all nations. Everyone agrees with that, save perhaps P. Kievsky. But this poses a question which Kievsky avoids. Is not negation of the right to form a national state negation of equality? Of course it is. And consistent, that is, socialist, Democrats proclaim, formulate, and will implement this right, without which there is no path to complete, voluntary rapprochement and merging of nations. Section 7. Conclusion. Alexinsky Methods. We have analyzed only a fraction of P. Kievsky's arguments. To analyze all of them would require an article five times the length of this one. There's not a single correct view in the whole of what Kievsky has to say. What is correct, if there are no mistakes in the figures, is the footnote data on banks. All the rest is an impossible tangle of confusion, peppered with phrases like driving a stake into the quivering body, we shall not only judge the conquering heroes, but condemn them to death and elimination. <laughs> That's just kind of, okay. The new world will be born in agonizing convulsions. The question will not be one of granting charters and rights, nor of proclaiming the freedom of nations, but of establishing genuinely free relationships, destroying age-old slavery and social oppression in general, and national oppression in particular, and so on and so forth. These phrases are, at one and the same time, the cover and expression of two things. First, their underlying idea is imperialist economism, which is just as ugly a caricature of Marxism and just as complete a misinterpretation of the relationship between socialism and democracy, as was the late and unlamented economism of 1894 to 1902. Second, we have in these phrases a repetition of Aleksinsky methods. This should be especially emphasized for a whole section of Kievsky's article. Chapter 2, Section F, The Special Position of the Jews, is based exclusively on these methods. At the 1907 London Congress, the Bolsheviks would dissociate themselves from Aleksinsky when, in reply to theoretical arguments, he would pose as an agitator and resort to highfalutin but entirely irrelevant phrases against one or another type of exploitation and oppression. He's begun his shouting again, our delegates would say, and the shouting did not do Aleksinsky any good. There is the same kind of shouting in Kievsky's article. He has no reply to the theoretical questions and arguments expounded in the theses. Instead, he poses as an agitator and begins shouting about the oppression of the Jews, though every thinking person will realize that his shouting, and the Jewish question in general, have no relation whatever to the subject under discussion. Aleksinsky methods can lead to no good. And that is the end of the audiobook. I think that this one is kind of a hidden classic, again, not the best known text from Lenin, but he really gets into some important topics on imperialism, socialism, and democracy, as well as topics pertaining to the national and colonial questions. It's only about two hours long, so, you know, movie length and um, pretty easy to digest, I think. I've added my commentary in efforts to make it more digestible for beginning students of Lenin and Marxism. If you have any further questions or comments, as always, leave them in the comments section. I'll do my best to reply to them. I like getting that feedback and handling additional questions. It's interesting to me to see what is confusing to people, what people find to resonate with them or to answer questions that they've been thinking about in, you know, going about trying to understand society today. 
So again, use the comment section for that, or you can ask the question in a live stream. Sometimes people get into sort of weird um, adversarial confrontational types of comments. There was actually somebody just this week, just really yesterday, I may have mentioned this earlier, talking about how supporting Palestine is campism. They wrote really, really lengthy, you know, just book length comments in the comment section and um, kind of nasty. And, you know, it's just bizarre to me when people do things like that, because I, first of all, I do not have time to read book length comments. If you do have a question or comment, you know, try to keep it to a short paragraph, maybe. And um, if you get, you know, into an angry tone in the comments with me, believe me, I have dozens of other comments to read. I'm not really going to spend time on that. So, you know, don't waste your time and mine. If you have a sincere question or a topic you'd like to raise, go ahead. But people have to go into that knowing that just not every idea that enters your head is going to be well supported. And there may be things that you're not familiar with that just completely negate it or show it to be untrue. And ultimately, that truth is what we're trying to get at here. We need to end capitalism, move beyond it. And, you know, how do we do that? That's what I'm reading these texts for. That's what brought me to study Marxism. We have massive political problems, which cannot be handled just by left liberalism, reformism, and so on. Uh, we have to end capitalism. It's not going to end itself. You can't just reform your way out of it either. Though, again, as mentioned earlier, both by me, I believe, and by Lenin, that struggle for reforms and that struggle for rights under capitalism, even though you're not going to be able to fully realize those rights under capitalism, is part of building the class consciousness. It's part of the overall struggle, which brings us to the actual revolutionary situation. You know, we're in 2023 now. Capitalism is going into another 2008-style crisis. We're probably currently in the equivalent of like a 2007. Prices are already starting to slip. We're in what will most likely, almost definitely, I would say, be proved to be a massive bubble overvaluation right now, which is going to come crashing down. It's the product of low interest rates, basically cheap free money for a long period of time. That was how they got out of 2008. And what happened? It just created another twice as large bubble. And when that pops, who the hell knows? But the point is, you know, as Lenin was saying in here, uh, your problems are not due to lack of rights. And you can realize that by gaining more rights that, hey, OK, that's a little better, but you still have some of the same basic problems. And it literally will take a socialist revolution. In other words, the ending of capitalism, that's the only way to do it, to see the end of those problems. There are features of capitalism that were in effect in 1916 when Lenin was writing this, which are still in effect today and which will persist to the end of capitalism. But again, getting the class consciousness to realize this and getting the understanding and experience with and familiarity with the system to come to that conclusion, capitalism must be ended, etc. It's not just a lack of rights. It's partly through that struggle for democratic rights and freedoms that people come to realize that. But anyway, with another crisis looming, you know, they let this happen again, will be my refrain, just 15 years later. We went through the GFC, the global financial crisis or great financial crisis or whatever they call it. And it was supposed to be this, you know, great moment of reflection and introspection for capitalism. What did they do? They just slashed interest rates and they were like, put this money back out into the system now, spend, spend, because there was a credit crunch. Banks weren't lending credit you know, of the businesses went way down. Nobody wanted to lend because everybody was fearing that there would be losses. You know, if they lent the money out, they wouldn't get it back. And so just basically economic activity was under threat of complete system paralysis. Well, they slapped on a couple of Band-Aid regulations and then just threw a ton of free money into the system. And it got things going again for about a decade. And then what started happening? They started trying to take some of that money out, quantitative tightening. What happened when they took even 5 or 10% of that money out? You got a stock market crash. Then in the pandemic, same thing happened. They dumped way more money and they doubled the amount of quantitative easing. Okay, we hit record prices in everything. Housing, every, you know, housing is uh, the most expensive purchase most people will ever make, you know, at least for those who do buy a house. And the prices are at record highs, or at least they were last year. They've come down a little bit. So they try to do the quantitative tightening. What happened? Well, six months ago, we got the collapse of SVB, Signature Bank, and a bailout. They put more money back into the system. So every time they try to take it out, there's some kind of crash. 
more small and mid-sized banks will fail. They're heavily involved in commercial real estate. There's a whole thing with that. But anyway, um, we're in this massive bubble. When it comes down, for one reason or another, what we're probably going to see is another 2008 type event. I did a long video on this recently. And while there will be relief in terms of prices, which is a really welcome thing for a lot of people, you go to the supermarket now, grocery trip cost you three, four hundred dollars for just kind of basics. Well, you know, that will be relieving to the extent that those prices come down. Unfortunately, there's also going to be a lot of people losing their jobs, losing their housing, all kinds of real economic pain and suffering. And then on the other side of it, capital is going to come out even more consolidated because the smaller, weaker, more poorly positioned capitalists will lose what they have, be forced to sell, and those with the money will buy it up. We're now over 40 years into the neoliberal period where, you know, it's deregulate, privatize, and slash social spending, leaving most of the population in a very vulnerable, precarious position. And again, you know, we had this big moment like a decade and a half ago, and they're just going to let it happen again, and it will happen again and again, because that's the nature of capitalism. So again, that's why we study this. We need to learn how to end it. It can be done. And, you know, as I point out to people, get to know your local left. There are organizations and parties in your area. They're going to have various flaws and this and that. But do see what you can get involved in to intensify the class struggle in your area. Even and, you know, do pick carefully because being in a bad party can be a life shattering experience. So pick carefully. But even if things don't work out perfectly, you will meet comrades and allies and it'll be good to have that network of contacts for the next time that things really do go down and you need to rally a bunch of people or you need to spread news or whatever it is. So that real life struggle is ultimately where this happens. You know, you can learn a lot online as far as the agitation and educational side of things. Organizing, though, has to be done and starts in your community, even if that's your county or your state or maybe your region. Some of the more rural areas may have less going on. But again, get to know your networks because it might seem like there's not as much going on. But if you get in touch with a party in the nearest city, you might meet somebody who knows about something that is happening in the area, but you wouldn't have known about it had you not met and talked to that person. All right, we're going to leave it there for now. Thanks again for listening and for your commitment to studying Marxism. We have big problems to solve, big struggles ahead, and we need knowledgeable and educated Marxists contributing to the strategic and tactical decisions that the movement is going to have to make. And also, as far as this channel is concerned, I would make content even if nobody supported, but I want to thank the supporters on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee for their ongoing support. Patreon.com slash Socialism For All or BuyMeACoffee.com slash Socialism For All. If you want to get your name on the screen along with these fine folks, colors indicate length of time that people have been supporters. Yellow is over a year. Green is over two years. Blue is over three years. If you like this channel, thank me, of course. I'm the one actually, you know, speaking into the microphone. But also thank a patron or buy me a coffee supporter. There's not really a good word for that one. Just set that up a few weeks ago. Anyway, thank a patron because it's their ongoing support that really lets this channel be what it is. It lets me spend as much time on it as I do. And that's important for not half-assing it, but actually doing the reading. Yeah, there's no real substitute for that. If you want to know what you're talking about, at least, which, you know, many streamers out there just absolutely have no idea what they're talking about. And uh, there's a lot of chaos and confusion, or as Lenin might have said, caricatures of Marxism going on being passed off as scientific socialism, when in fact they're probably more in line with things that have been debunked decades or maybe even a century ago. So I give my thanks as well to the supporters, whether it's Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee. This is a non-commercial channel. We don't run ads or sponsorships, and it is viewer supported. So again, if you'd like to help out with that, every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so thanks. And lastly, whether you're a patron or not, Hit like, share, subscribe. That engagement helps to drive this channel and these videos in the YouTube algorithm. And it helps the YouTube system to put this content in front of more eyeballs. And in these times of crisis for capitalism and increasing fascization of the society, we need people to connect with this and get involved in things that are going to be useful for promoting, spreading, and intensifying class struggle. Thanks again. We'll see you in the next video.